Well, hello, my name is uh, John Risbridger, one of the ministers at Above Bar, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Deeper this afternoon, an opportunity to explore a Bible passage and hear what God is saying to us through it. And uh, today we're continuing our look through the book of Daniel, and we've got to chapter five. So uh, I'm going to read that to you now. Daniel chapter five, and uh, if you've got a Bible or a phone nearby, It would be good for you to have this in front of you. Daniel chapter 5 from verse 1. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold tablets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the musicians, uh, magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king, brought from Judah? I've heard that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they couldn't explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed round your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, 
mene, tekel, parson. And here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed round his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Let's pray, shall we, uh, as we come to explore this passage in a few moments. Father, thank you that this gripping ancient narrative, which arrests our attention and draws us in to its drama, thank you that this narrative is in your word to us. And we pray that that word would speak into our lives at this particular moment, and that we would hear you speak, that our strength and our courage and our faith would be built to trust you and to speak for you in our generation, as Daniel did in his. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in many ways, that passage is a passage about the glory of Yahweh, the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel. And uh, we're going to, uh, to sing about that glory, a song which, which calls all of creation to join in praise of this great God. It's the song, Praise Him, You Heavens. Let's enjoy this song as we worship together. very welcome to this session of Deeper, whether you're part of Above Bar Church or another church or no church at all. But if you are from uh, Above Bar, you uh, will probably know Keith Brown, who's one of the church members here. 
Uh, Keith has spent years as a leading professor of social work and has uh, huge opportunities to speak with influence to leading figures in the worlds of national and local governments uh, and the NHS and business too. And I love sitting with Keith over a drink and, and hearing his stories of the, uh, the doors that God has opened. But when I do, Keith often reminds me of the years of unglamorous, behind-the-scenes research, networking, writing and teaching and hard work, really, that led to this season in his life when there are so many openings to bring God's wisdom to people of power and influence. And I think that's an important perspective, actually, to bring to the book of Daniel. You see, it would be easy to read this book as if Daniel's life were an uninterrupted stream of dramatic encounters with powerful rulers and high adrenaline experiences of, uh, of, of, of the victory of, of courageous faith in Yahweh. But I think that would be to misread the book and to misrepresent Daniel's story. See, as we get to chapter 5, 66 years have passed and four kings have died since Daniel's initial arrival in Babylon as one of Nebuchadnezzar's exiles from Judah. Those 66 years have included a number of defining moments, as we've seen in the first four chapters. But along with those defining moments, there have also been many, many years of undramatic service as a, a trusted advisor to the king, a faithful hard work for the glory of his God. And at least latterly, those years have included a period, we don't know quite how long, but a period of obscurity where he was largely forgotten by the powerful. Nonetheless, those years of undramatic faithfulness to God and hard work in service of the king had both created the opportunities for Daniel to speak up for God in high places and given him the courage to take those opportunities when they came. But if we forget the years of hard slog and faithfulness, we might get the wrong idea as to what Daniel's life was really like and forget the foundations on which his particular ministry was based. Well, today we come to perhaps the most dramatic of all these encounters with the powerful, as, as Daniel is pulled out of obscurity to announce the ends of the empire to the king who was ruling it at the time, King Belshazzar, as we've read. We begin in verses one to four, where we see God's glory is defied. God's glory is defied. Verse one, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Nothing unusual about that. But while he was doing so, the armies of Cyrus the Persian were already surrounding the city. The king's complacency is frankly quite shocking. But here's a problem. Who was that king? You see, he's introduced to us as Nebuchadnezzar's son. So we might imagine that this was just the direct heir of Nebuchadnezzar. But actually, in the ancient world, a king's son could be several generations removed from the original king and still be referred to as the son. But even that doesn't resolve our issue here. Let me explain. Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C., he was succeeded by his first generation son, a guy called Evil Merodach, who was then assassinated by his brother-in-law, Nereglissa. And Nereglissa's son, Labishi Marduk, was assassinated by a group of conspirators, including a fellow called Nabonidus, who reigned until the end of the empire in 539 BC. That's what we know from the history. And no Belshazzar. What do we make of that? Well, of course, it's led many sceptical scholars to question the validity and reliability of Daniel's book. And they had a field day until in the mid 19th century, a series of cylinders were found in the town of Ur that Abraham came from with inscriptions about Belshazzar, the firstborn son of Nabonidus. It seems that Nabonidus spent the latter half of his reign away from Babylon in Arabia 
and left the kingdom with his son, Belshazzar. And that may, of course, be the reason why Belshazzar could only offer Daniel the third highest rank, verse 16 in the kingdom, because actually he was himself only really number two. In any case, where we meet him here in chapter five, Belshazzar is losing his grip on power. And his famous feast here feels rather too much like arranging deck deck chairs on the sinking Titanic. But it's more than just a poorly timed feast that's the problem here. Verse two, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king, his nobles, his wives and his concubines could drink from them. Well, you can read about those articles back in Daniel chapter one, verse two. And we uh, we saw at the time these were articles that the book of Exodus had declared as most holy to the Lord, set apart for the exclusive worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But now they've found their way to Babylon. And now in this show of breathtaking sacrilege and defiance, Belshazzar presses them into service for this drunken feast of what turned out to be idol worship. Verse four, as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. It's no surprise that Daniel is outraged by what happened. Verse 23, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which you cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds your holds in his hand your life and all your ways. God's glory is defied blatantly, brazenly. But then second in verses five to nine, God's response is seen. Verse five, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote and his face turned pale and he was so frightened his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Archaeologists have actually done excavations of this very room where this happened, the throne room of ancient Babylon, and shown that uh, that three of the four walls in that throne room were covered in white plaster, exactly as the text here describes. But now on one of these walls, the handwriting of God is making its inscription. The king sees it with terror. And for the third time in the book of Daniel, neither the king nor his sages can decipher God's word of revelation. God's response is seen, but it isn't understood. So God's glory defied, God's response seen. And then verses 10 to 29, God's servant speaks out. God's servant speaks out. The queen speaks up. It may actually have been the queen mother, but that's a detail. And she recommends plucking Daniel out of his obscurity to see if he can help. And so that's what happens. Verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles, my father, the king brought from Judah? You can probably hear a measure of contempt in the way that he's addressing him there. One of the exiles. Nonetheless, this acting king who has mocked the holy goblets brought up from Judah, is now trembling, desperately hanging on the words of one of the holy people who'd been exiled from Judah. And so it is that Daniel has his opportunity to speak truth to power, devastating truth to arrogant, defiant power. First of all, in verse 17, he rapidly dismisses Belshazzar's offer of reward. And next he gives him an unrequested history lesson about how God had given Nebuchadnezzar power and then humbled him when his heart became proud, stripping him of his glory until, verse 21b, he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. There's the history lesson. 
But then after the history lesson, the moment of confrontation. And you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Verse 22, but you, Belshazzar, his son, Nebuchadnezzar's son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. In other words, you knew the story of what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You saw how God had humbled him. But still, you have acted in defiance and failed to humble yourself. But you're without excuse because you knew it all. And now you've shaken your fist in the face of the God of heaven. And it's that act which has brought you the handwriting of God. Verse 24, therefore, he sent the handwriting that wrote the inscription. Verse 25, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. And the scholars tell us that these three words probably refer to three units of currency or of weight or probably both. So Mene or a minor, half a kilogram. Tekel, a shekel, about 10 grams. Parson. That's half, probably half a shekel, five grams. In other words, it's moving from a fortune, a minor, to a small wage, a shekel, to the change in your pocket, passing, half. The three words speak clearly and ominously of decline. Decline to almost nothing. Because, of course, Belshazzar's empire is even at this moment drawing its last breath as Cyrus's noose tightens around the city. But Daniel goes beyond this simple sequence of decline to the, the verbal form of each of these words and finds in that form a rather more specific message. So he says uh, in verse 26, here is what these words mean. Mene, which means numbered, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. And then in verse 27, tekel, which means weighed, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And then in verse 28, perez, in its singular form, means hard. Verse 28, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's a word of judgment. And within just a few hours, the word of judgment becomes a reality. We've seen God's glory defied, God's response seen, God's servant speaking out. And now verses 30 and 31, God's judgment falls. Verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Here we are, 66 years later, the empire which had conquered Judah and taken its leaders into captivity is finally conquered itself. If you know your history, under this new world order, under Cyrus's lead, the exiles eventually found their way home. Last week, we saw Daniel speak a word of warning to Nebuchadnezzar that led to repentance. But this week, the opportunity for repentance has passed. And we see him speak a word, a word of judgment that leads to destruction, destruction of an empire, destruction of a ruler. God's judgment falls. Here is speaking truth to power in perhaps its most dramatic form. But it's an arresting story, an interesting story. But what does it have to say to you and me today? Let me just draw four points together as we finish. First, let's see God's passionate concern here for his own glory. God's glory, that is his intrinsic majesty and his reputation. That's God's glory. And it's the most important thing in the universe. It's the most important thing even to God himself. For if anything other than his own glory were uppermost in God's attention, God himself would become guilty of idolatry. Now, the glory of God is uppermost in his concern. He's passionate for his own glory. And here Belshazzar blatantly defies that glory. And in the face of such defiance, God will not stand by and do nothing. Of course, God does not always act with the same immediacy that we see in this story. But the point of the swift response here is to leave us in no doubt that God will act 
when his glory is defined. He will in his own time. See, God created us to know and to prize and to reflect his glory in creation. And so to reject that fundamental call that lies at the very heart of human existence and defy his glory is to put ourselves under his judgment, rejecting the very purpose of our existence. When he will act in response to our defiance, that's a mystery that lies with God. That he will act, that much is left absolutely clear. And we await his timing. So God's passionate concern for his own glory. But then second, we see God calling us to humble ourselves in repentance where we have defied his glory. Nebuchadnezzar's story, as we saw last week, shows God's kindness and slowness to anger, and it shows it in spades. And Nebuchadnezzar did repent and humble himself before God and was restored. Belshazzar knew all this. After all, Nebuchadnezzar had written it down so that everyone would know. He says that at the end of the chapter. But Belshazzar, despite knowing it, persistently refused to do the same himself. See, fallen human beings don't want God at the center of our lives. It's part of the human condition. We want to be in control ourselves. But when our glory and reputation matters more to us than the glory of God, we're turning reality on its head. And yet this is what we do. And God calls us to repent and turn around and reorientate our lives and humble ourselves before the supremacy of his glory, which must come first. The great news is that in Jesus, God has provided us with a way back. We glimpsed it last week in chapter four in Nebuchadnezzar's story. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our rebellion so that if we do repent and turn around and put our trust in him, we can be forgiven and given a new start. So I just want to say to you, if you're watching uh, this this deeper episode and, and you actually know deep in your heart that you have never repented of seeking your own glory above the glory of God, you've never repented of that self-centered life, that we naturally pursue as human beings. And I just want to ask you to take that step this afternoon. Ask Jesus to forgive you, to give you that new start. Or if you have taken that step many years ago, but it feels like a distant memory and life has gone upside down and all the wrong way around ever since, and you know you've drifted away and things are out of joint in your life, come back today. Make that opportunity, take that opportunity to repent, to renew your faith in the supremacy of God and his glory and to allow your life to be shaped around it. God calls us to humble ourselves in repentance before him. But then thirdly, I want us to see God's power here to open a door. He did that for Daniel, as we've seen, this this lonely, sidelined exile, quietly living out his faith in an unnoticed corner of Babylon. But then God steps in and opens the door and plucks him out of obscurity. And though Daniel probably hadn't seen the limelight for decades, he is still ready, sharp as an arrow, because he had guarded his heart and walked closely with his God. So we too need to guard our hearts and maintain our readiness and stay attentive, looking for where God is calling us to speak. It might be to kings and ministers. It might be to neighbours and friends and family. But we need to be ready because Yahweh is the God who opens doors for his people to speak. And fourthly, God's calling, which is a calling to speak up. Of course, most of the opportunities to speak that we get are much less dramatic than this one. Though it's true, our society and our workplaces and our local communities, they still need that voice for justice and for integrity and for humility, which is why it's both exciting 
to, uh, to, to hear stories of people like Keith and others like him who, who have those opportunities and, and why we need to be there backing them in our prayers and our support when they speak up for God in the place of power. But ultimately, Daniel's message was about acknowledging the reign of God, a call to turn from our preoccupation with ourselves and to give God the loyalty of our hearts and the allegiance of our lives. And friends, all Christians are called to witness to those things and to the good news of what God has done in Jesus to bring forgiveness for our rebellion, restoration for our brokenness and hope for our eternity. The mission of the people of God, even when we find ourselves in exile, as in many ways we do today, the mission of the people of God is not to be a silent mission. We are called to speak. We are called to be a voice, a voice for God, a voice for truth, a voice for righteousness, a a voice for, for justice, a prophetic voice, and most of all, a gospel voice speaking of Jesus wherever we can. So let's stay grounded in God. Let's stay attentive to what he's doing. Let's keep our eyes open for the doors that he opens. And let's not lose our nerve to be speaking Christians in a world that needs to hear the word of the God who still speaks into it today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you open doors for your people to speak. Thank you for the way that you sustained Daniel through those incredibly demanding years of exile so that he was ready to speak when the door was open and the opportunity came. Help us, Lord, to do that hard work of serving, of trusting, of seeking you, of staying close to you and walking with you and serving our communities with integrity and hard work and diligence so that when the time comes when you open the door to speak, we can do so with courage, with godliness, with clarity and with credibility. And Lord, most of all, make us attentive to the doors that you are opening for us to speak. Those words of truth, of righteousness, of justice, those words of good news as we delight to tell people about Jesus and what he's done. And when those doors come and open to us, Lord, please give us the grace to speak with clarity, with winsomeness and with courage. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, sing a song now which uh, calls us to speak up, to be, to be speaking Christians, not silent Christians. It's the song, God gave us his son, I am not ashamed. Let's enjoy this song together. God gave us his son, the sinless one to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. We're being changed into your likeness Children of light It's our time to
Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us for uh, this this session of, of going deeper with God in Daniel chapter 5. I hope it's been helpful to you. May God strengthen us to be speaking Christians in the week ahead. Hope you're able to join us for prayer this evening at 7.45. If you're watching this uh, on the Sunday, uh, we've had some great times praying together for our church and our city. It's all on Zoom. You can find the details on our website and we'll be delighted to welcome you. But as we go, let me say those words of uh, the priestly blessing uh, for all of us from number six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, the great high priest. Amen.